Uh, hi everyone, my name is Rumbi. I'm an associate editor here at DevX. And today I'm joined for, by two people for a very interesting conversation. We have uh, Professor Helen Fletcher, a professor of immunology at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, as well as Dr. Jerome Kim, Director General for the International Vaccine Institute. Um, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. Okay, so today we're here to talk about mRNA technology, that's messenger RNA technology, and this technology has been described as a game changer. So why, why does it have so much potential and can you tell us a little bit more about it? I think I'll start with you, Helen. Um, yeah, sure, thank you. Um, well, I work in vaccine development and I teach vaccine immunology and um, I always start my lectures by saying that vaccines are our most effective and cost effective public health tool. And if you look at the history of vaccine development, um, you know, it started back in the 18th century with um, whole live organisms. Um, and then we attenuated or heat killed those organisms. And then uh, we used uh, sort of subunits um, and then conjugate technologies um, and so on. And what we see is that each time there is a new platform technology, we see a wave of vaccine development. And the exciting thing about the mRNA technology is that it's a new platform technology for vaccines. And so I expect that we will see a wave of vaccine development for a range of pathogens in the way that we have done when we've introduced um, new vaccine technologies in uh, previous years. So we started talking a lot about mRNA technology around the COVID vaccine and the development of COVID vaccines for that. Why, were, why weren't we not speaking about this technology before or were there conversations around it and people were just not aware? I'll pass this on to you, Jerome. Thank you. RNA technology has been around uh, for a bit over two decades. In fact, when I was still doing work in HIV vaccines in the early 2000s, we were working with companies that eventually became part of GSK uh, that were working on different types of RNA vaccines. There had been a couple of publications on the testing of RNA vaccines in humans, one from CureVac, which is one of the RNA companies involved in COVID vaccine development, and another one from Moderna. And the induced uh, levels of protection, the immune responses to those vaccines were not as strong as we would have hoped. Um, but like many technologies that are emerging, the first swing uh, isn't necessarily always a home run. That's, I guess, an American baseball term, but it isn't always a, a smashing success. And, and the same is true of mRNA technology. And so, frankly, when, when I saw that you know, CEPI was going to pay for uh, two different kinds of RNA technology, I thought, oh, not again. Um, is this what we really want? But they have made significant changes in the RNA technology, particularly in the mode of presentation. The use of these lipid nanoparticles has, um, and, and potentially new manufacturing techniques have improved the ability to manufacture and, and develop mRNA vaccines that actually have the kinds of immune responses that are important and, and, and very importantly protective. Okay, so we've seen um, this working in the COVID space and I think that was a little bit of a home run there in the COVID space, but in terms of other diseases and what are the challenges and opportunities for adapting this technology to other diseases? And I know both of you can speak to this. So maybe we can start with you, Helen. I know you've been doing a lot of work in the TB space and then Jerome, maybe you can add on to that as well. Um, yeah, so uh, until COVID-19, tuberculosis was the uh, single uh, largest killer due to infectious disease globally, and around 2 million people a year die of uh, tuberculosis, and actually up to a third of the world's population are infected with TB. Um, and but we don't hear about this. Um, we don't, you know, we don't see TB being a priority pathogen in the way that COVID-19 is. And of course, it's, it's because tuberculosis largely affects people living in low and middle income countries. And also it's a very slowly progressing disease. And so people live with tuberculosis 
for years before they die and they people just slowly fade away um, and they get stigmatized and so they'll perhaps be you know excluded from society from their families people are afraid of infection and so we've seen this silent pandemic of tuberculosis which has been with us for many centuries um, and it's absolutely right that we should be turning our attention now to diseases such as TB to see what have we learned from COVID-19 that we can apply to tuberculosis so that we can um, control and you know, potentially even eliminate this pathogen, which has a devastating effect on so many people globally. And the mRNA technology, you know, does this, is this new platform, is this new technology a way that we could really stimulate TB vaccine development? I mean, we've had a TB vaccine since um, the 1920s. In fact, 2021 is the 100th year anniversary since BCG was first used in a, a human clinical trial. So we have this vaccine and uh, BCG, is partially protective. We see that it has about 50% efficacy against uh, the most severe childhood forms of tuberculosis, but it isn't effective against adult pulmonary disease. And so we still see transmission of TB in communities for this reason. So we need better vaccines for TB, and this has been understood for many years. But despite 20 years of vaccine development for TB, the pipeline is very empty and the pipeline is very slowly moving. So we have about 25 vaccine candidates in the TB vaccine pipeline, compared to about 250 in the COVID-19 vaccine pipeline, despite the fact that, you know, we've been developing vaccines for TB for 100 years. We're, we're so behind and so slow in the way that we react. So I really do hope that this mRNA technology will bring us uh, and stimulate um, the, the TB vaccine pipeline and bring us some new candidates that we might work with. But the problem is that, you know, tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis is a bacterial pathogen. It's not a virus. So it's much more complex in its structure. And it has ways in which that it evades the immune response. So for example, it evades an antibody response by actually hiding within a human cell and replicating within a human cell. And so these neutralizing antibodies, which the mRNA vaccines are incredibly good at inducing, may not be enough to control uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis. So I am really excited about the potential of the mRNA vaccine platforms, but it's not gonna be easy for TB. Um, we're not going to be able to take exactly the same platform that we've used for COVID-19 and apply it to mycobacterium tuberculosis. It's very likely that we're gonna to have to modify the mRNA vaccines in some way. So we're going to have to um, modulate them so that we induce more of a T cellular immune response in addition to an antibody response. It may be that we have to deliver them directly to the lung so that we can get them to the site of uh, M. tuberculosis primary infection um, rather than delivering them systemically. So there are challenges ahead, um, but there's also opportunities. And, and I think we, we absolutely should be um, driving forward now, looking at tuberculosis and other pathogens of global importance as well to see where we could apply this new platform technology. Uh, thanks so much. And Jerome, just to bring you into the conversation, do we see the same opportunities in the HIV space? Yes, and so I think that, that Helen makes a great point. Um, the RNAs that were tested in COVID, um, in, in a sense, had an easy proof of concept. This is a virus where an inactivated viruses work, where adenovirus vectors of various types that express COVID um, surface uh, spike protein appear to work. Um, the mRNA vaccines appear to work. The Novavax protein appears to work. So this was a good target. The targets that we're interested in, tuberculosis, HIV, and I would throw out malaria and, and diseases like schistosomiasis as well, where vaccine development has been more difficult because the pathogen 
hides or changes itself um, or as a part of its life cycle expresses different uh, important components to the immune system um, may present more of a problem, but the RNA vaccines offer a new way to approach them. So for instance, with HIV, you know, we've tried proteins, we've tried viral vectors of different kinds, including adenovirus vectors. Um, and really we've had one modest success, but a lot of failures. One of the things we've learned over the last 10 years is that a particular set of immune genes that form the infection fighting proteins appear to be critical for the generation of what we call broadly neutralizing antibodies. The problem is that they may need to be tickled in sequence and perhaps the use of, of RNA vectors allows us a certain amount of flexibility in being able to target those evolving sectors of the, of the binding parts of the antibody to generate broadly neutralizing antibody. Now it's just a, a concept but it's something that the RNA technologies bring forward. I think the other important thing that um, Helen brought out uh, is that you know, we have a lot of vaccines that work currently, a lot of bacterial vaccines that are very important for childhood diseases. Uh, things that are binding to um, special sugars that coat the outside of bacteria. Those might be more difficult to develop RNA vaccines against. So it may not be that we're reinventing all vaccines. I mean, certain vaccines perhaps, uh, vaccines with too much toxicity or uh, vaccines for difficult targets like HIV, TB, malaria. Um, but some of the other vaccines are probably going to stay as they are. And, and the other part is these are vaccines that we know we can mass produce at very low cost uh, and distribute around the world with um, very easy logistics. Those aren't things that necessarily the, the TB vaccines have achieved yet. I mean, maybe in time. Um, but but there are gonna be other vaccines out there that we probably won't replace right away. So one of the questions I was going to ask both of you was uh, with the COVID-19 vaccine, we saw these vaccines being developed at record speed. And are we going to see the same speed applied to the development of vaccines maybe in the TB space or the HIV space? But what I'm hearing is that it's not that simple. Am I correct, Helen? Yeah, that's right. It's not it's not that simple. We're, we're not uh, going to be able to take these technologies um, for the, all, all the reasons that we, we discussed. You know, these are, are complex pathogens that are remaining, um, which, which need broad types of immune responses. Um, and, and the mRNA vaccines may well have a role and it might be an important role, um, but perhaps, a, uh, you know, a sort of multi vaccine uh, platform, um, you know, one one vaccine matched with another type of vaccine, for example. Um, but it's, it's not going to be as simple as just taking it and using it. And of course, um, as well with, with tuberculosis, um, we have the BCG vaccine. And at the moment, that vaccine is um, sold at 10 cents a dose for global use. It's one of the mo most widely used vaccines globally only at 10 cents a dose. So even if the mRNA uh, technologies come down in cost, they are so far away to being accessible for people living in low and middle income countries. Um, so there's a long way to go. And, and absolutely, in, in, including the cold chain as well, if you look at the challenges with distribution, um, you know, a vaccine, even a vaccine which is stored at minus 20 degrees rather than minus 70 degrees, the complexity of delivering that kind of vaccine into, you know, rural clinics, for example, where women are giving birth and where you maybe want to immunizing infants is, is huge. Um, so there are, um, you know, remaining challenges absolutely with using and deploying these new vaccine technologies. So when you speak about accessibility and sharing this technology, what role is the mRNA technology hub going to play in all of this? Um, Jerome, I'll pass this question on to you. I think the important question is which mRNA technology hub? I think countries around the world have been very actively pursuing uh, mRNA as a, as a potential technology. But, you know, one of the things is that we, and, and I'm sure Professor Fletcher has done this too. I mean, our labs prepare our uh, it's been, it's difficult. It's, um, it, you have to be absolutely certain about the preparation. It isn't the RNA itself, but the process that goes into manufacturing these RNA technologies that make them uh, not as easy to copy. And, and I read an article, so I don't know if this is necessarily true, 
uh, that the Pfizer-BioNTech vaccine uh, requires 50,000 steps. So it isn't the RNA, it's the process of making these that is going to be really critical in order to generate the, the kinds of vaccines that we want for some of the other diseases uh, that we're interested in. So I hope that the mRNA technology is mature. I hope that the lipid nanoparticle or the other mechanisms to deliver these uh, RNA molecules um, continues to improve so that we don't see you know, very high levels of, of fever as a side effect or that people don't feel like they've uh, they got the flu when they get the second dose of the vaccine. I mean, these are all incremental improvements that I think we can make. Um, I think it's important that countries around the world, um, universities and, and research centers, um, continue to advance RNA technology. And, you know, we have to be really thankful for the governments around the world that funded this research initially, um, because without it, the companies wouldn't have the technological base in which they built these, um, these very effective vaccines for COVID. So I think, yes, it's going to be important. Uh, it's important that, that this technology be disseminated, and it's important that we make improvements in it so that they become more accessible. Okay, so um, we're coming to the end of our conversation. So just uh, as a final thought, I'll ask both of you this. So what will it take for us to actually fast track the use of this technology and to make sure that it's accessible? A double question there for you guys. I'll start with you, Helen. Um, I mean, I think that the uh, WHO initiative, having the technology transfer hubs um, uh, is, is, a, is a great start. And so you're looking at uh, increasing manufacturing capacity for mRNA vaccines globally. Um, if, you, if you look below the surface of that, um, then they are looking for hubs which already have the ability, existing ability to manufacture on large scale. They are looking for products and vaccines which are already proven in clinical trials to be able to transfer to those hubs. And, and that is great and it, it's a great start. Um, and, uh, but there are so few, there are going to be so few facilities which fulfill those criteria. So few facilities in low and middle income countries which already have that capacity for large scale manufacturing, although there are some. Um, and then you're going to, and then you're waiting for those products and those vaccines to come along and for the intellectual property to be made available so that um, that manufacturing can happen. But, you know, I mean, what we really need is, first of all, sustainability. So we need to be building those manufacturing sites, building that capacity in a sustainable way so that it's not just, you know, swooping in and, uh, you know, using facilities for manufacturing and then moving on when it's not needed. You need those facilities to exist and to grow um, and for the capacity strengthening um, to, to, to be broadly distributed um, in, in many countries, um, not just single centres in each region. But you need investment for that. So you need money to support manufacturing. And beyond that, I think it's also really important to invest in research uh, directly in low and middle income countries as well, because these manufacturing plants can't be passively waiting for people in wealthier countries to come up with some intellectual property or some research idea for a vaccine. It should be countries themselves who are driving the research agendas, making sure that the uh, research programs and the manufacturing is focused on pathogens of relevance to their own country and their own region and their own scientists who are um, you know, actually building uh, these these vaccines and and testing them and owning the intellectual property so that that can feed into these manufacturing plants um, as well and I think I think you know it's a really great start to have distribution of vaccine technologies and manufacturing capacity but it needs to be matched by the distribution of research and the academic strength as well. And I think when those two things come together and if they're invested in appropriately, then we'll see a real renaissance in vaccine development and vaccines of relevance for global health.
Uh, thank you so much, Helen. And we're just left with one minute, unfortunately. So Jerome, any final thoughts on this? So I agree completely with that, uh, Professor Fletcher. But if you go to the Duke Global Health Innovation website, there's actually by manufacturer a list of where the, the vaccines are being made or fill and finished in the world. And it's actually a very interesting website because when you look at the AstraZeneca vaccine, it is really manufactured and actually filled and finished all over the world. But when you look at the RNA vaccines, the number of sites where those vaccines are made is very restricted, primarily North America and Europe and, and one site in China. And you know, that's going to change and it needs to change. As the technology matures, as countries and companies are, are able to open up. The, the only other thing that I'd add to what Professor Fletcher said is, in the end, someone has to buy the vaccine. So not only do we have to have the model of funding the vaccine development, but in the end, no company is gonna make a vaccine that people won't buy. And so if we have smaller regional manufacturers, someone has to commit to buy that vaccine at a, at a higher price than we would normally get if we went to the Serum Institute or to a you know, mass manufacturer in Korea that can churn out vaccine at, at a relatively low unit cost. So we're going to have to find, as, as Professor Fletcher said, a sustainable model for funding not only vaccine research, but the other end, which is the uptake of those vaccines and their use in global health. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you so much, both of you, for this fascinating conversation. And I know that our journalists will be following this. And um, I know that your institutions will also be following this. Um, thank you. Thank you.